right, let's go ahead and turn to Nehemiah chapter 11. We got three chapters left. I'm going to try to do it in two more weeks, two lessons. I'm going to try to get 11 and 12 for the most part done tonight. And then we'll try to hit chapter 13 on its own. Um, I don't know if we'll split up chapter 13, but two more lessons uh, at the most three. Um, but we're shooting to get it done in two lessons. We're in chapter 11. And what were we able to see last week? We were able to see the impact of God's law being read to Israel. They were convicted. They realized areas that they needed improvement. And then they committed to addressing them. Right? It's, it's, it's all well and good for us to come to God's house and to hear God's word preached and to feel convicted and think, you know, man, he's right. I, there's some things I really ought to work on. Um, but then don't actually try to commit to those things, really put forth the effort to get those things right. And it looks like the people of Israel were going to. They, they signed it. They signed this and sealed it and made a commitment that they were going to get back to, to doing what's right in their homes and their families and their business dealings on the Sabbath day and on the temple itself and how they were not going to forsake. That's what we saw at the end of chapter 10. It mentions that we will not forsake the house of our God. So we're up to chapter 11. The walls have been rebuilt. Spiritual things are starting to get back in order. So what's left? Well, let's look at a couple things tonight. Number one, repopulating, repopulating Jerusalem. Chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in the Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in the other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. You see, it wasn't just enough um, to see the city walls rebuilt and the correction uh, of some spiritual things. Now they want to get more people into the city. For a city to be great and, and to prosper, it has to have people in it, right? When you think of major cities, what do we consider major cities? We consider those cities that are well populated, don't we? When we think of major cities in our country, we think of... New York, and we think of Los Angeles, Chicago, Phoenix, Minneapolis, uh, Seattle. We think of hubs of activity. We think of places where there is a, a, a great population. There's a great population center, places that have a lot of people coming in and going out. For a long time, Jerusalem, the city, had been severely underpopulated. One commentary that I was reading used literally the phrase ghost town, just, just, just severely underpopulated and uh, just not very many people at all. Now, some things have happened over the last number of years. The captivity is completed. They've got a new temple. The walls have been rebuilt, but it needs more people. The bigger the population of Jerusalem the greater the resources, right? The, the more able they'll be to defend it, strengthen battle, those kind of things. Nehemiah didn't rebuild these walls just to see an army come down soon and destroy them again because there's nobody left to defend it. Um, so let's repopulate this city. And here we've got the plan to do so in verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 1, first of all, it says that the leaders, it says verse number 1, and the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. Now, that's a good example. That's a good place to start. It's always good when the leaders set an example. So the leaders took up resident. The leaders were dwelling in Jerusalem. If you want to lead any group of people in any kind of vocation, you have to set the pattern by your own life, right? Uh, at work, they, you know, it's, it's not a great idea at work to put the laziest guy in charge. Nobody will listen to him. Nobody will take him seriously. Nobody wants to put the laziest guy in charge. Um, in the local church, nobody wants to put in a leader or have a pastor that by his own character 
doesn't set the example, isn't himself an example of godliness, right? You read 1 Timothy chapter 3, and that's actually one of the criteria that, that for a pastor, it mentions things about his home life, right? It talks about how he has to have children in subjection. He has to rule well those that are in his house. And then it gives you the phrase, it tells you, because if he can't rule well his own house, how's he going to be able to take care of the church, right? If you, you nobody would ever select a pastor uh, that doesn't have any character, that's not disciplined, that's not um, a man of uh, integrity, honesty, hardworking. So the leaders have to set the example, and it looks like that's what's happening here in verse 1. Rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. If you want to lead, if you ever have any ambitions for leadership, um, set the example. Be a good testimony yourself. But then it tells us, the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. One out of ten. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly how they determined this, but the rest of the people submitted themselves to some kind of lottery system, to some kind of casting of lots, where one out of ten would be selected to move from the surrounding regions into the city. Now, how would you like that, right? How would you like to have a home that's, you know, in, in one, of the ra- you know, one of the neighboring villages, and that's where all of your family is, right? You, you've been there for years. You've cut yourself out a nice little piece of land, and you've, you've farmed it, and you've built yourself a little place. And, and now, all of a sudden, one out of ten are going to be selected to go to Jerusalem. You know, that's... That's interesting. That's interesting to think. You're like, how would I feel? What would I do if I was selected? What would I do if someone close to me was selected? That's that's just something interesting to think about. But one out of ten were going to be selected to move into the city. Now, verse 2 says, And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. It sounds like some... We're willing. Some signed up for it, right? Some, you know, here, listen, this is the plan. We've got the leaders here, and we're going to set up some kind of system where a tenth of the population of Judea has to live within the city walls, right? One out of ten. A tenth of the population of Judea has to live within the city walls. Some people volunteered. Some people volunteered to do so, and verse 2 tells us that the people blessed them. And it sounds, while it sounds like a good number were willing to go, we were reminded that it's not really a small thing. Uh, It's fun, right? It's it's fun to see people that have that pioneer spirit and that are always willing to step out and go and cut out something new for themselves and start over again. And there's always that kind of, I'm not that kind of person, okay? Uh, I don't enjoy new things. Um, I'm the oldest person here and I'm, not the oldest in age. But, uh, you know, people that are like that, people that even have that spirit about them, that doesn't by any means indicate that it's an easy thing, right? These people have to willingly move from their previous homes. They are potentially giving up that, like I said, that piece of land that, that they've been working for a number of years. Maybe they're going to be separated from other members of their family. Uh, They put themselves potentially in harm's way, right, by getting back into the city. Um, If the enemy comes against Jerusalem, or if they come against Judea, they're not going to probably take the little village that's 20 miles up the road. They're going to start, they're going to bombard and siege the city of Jerusalem. You could potentially be putting yourself in harm's way. It's, It's... by no means a small thing, right? And that's why it says that they blessed them. There were people that were willingly uh, or that were willing to step out and realize that this was important, this was a good thing, these walls have been rebuilt, it is important for us to reestablish this city. Men willingly left behind the homes that they had before to go and populate, okay? Um, and, and they were due a blessing, they, they were honored for doing so. 
Now, remember, a tenth of you are going anyway. Now, I don't know exactly how they were going to establish that, but it's one of those things that, you know, you should volunteer or you might be volunteered. Um, but those that did volunteer were blessed, and it was thankful that the men were willing to do so. I am thankful for those that are willing and step out just with a willing attitude to do what it seems like needs to be done. This was the right call. It was the right thing to do. The temple's built. The walls are rebuilt. We got to get this city back on its feet. And some men were up to the task. Some men were willing to leave behind what they had known and come and start over again so that they could rebuild God's city. Verse 3 down to verse 36, we're not going to read. It's a lot of names, but we have a roster of the names and of the villages, the people that were represented, and the places that they came from. So that's what chapter 11 is about, the repopulating of Jerusalem. It started with the leaders, and that's important. It's important for leaders to set the example. You don't ever want to be someone who... Um, it's not fun to ask people to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. Pe people, people snuff that stuff out. If you're not willing to do it yourself, it's you know, not helpful to ask everyone else to do so. It started with the leaders. They set up some kind of lottery system or the casting of lots to get 10% of the population within the city walls. And uh, blessing, honor was on those that were willing to do so of their own accord. Now, chapter 12, our second thought tonight, and this will be our last thought, is the dedication of the walls. The dedication of the walls. Chapter 12 continues on with another great list of names, and we're not going to read all of those, but chapter 12 gives us a list of the priestly and the Levitical families. They're broken down into the days of Zerubbabel, the days of Joachim, and the reign of Darius. But where we really want to focus picks up in verse number 27. Because now that the names are mentioned, and it's mentioned the priests, and it's mentioned the Levites, it begins to mention the dedication of the walls. And in dedicating the walls, it looks like they have a very big worship service. Verse 27, it says, this is chapter 12, verse 27, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem, to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings, with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. You know, the Levites had many responsibilities during the life and worship of Israel. We saw in previous chapters how it was the Levites that stood up and the Levites who were responsible for publicly reading God's Word, publicly teaching God's Word. And so they, they were very important. They had a very busy life, a very important role to play in the public worship of God. Um, and in the spiritual deeds, um, the sacrifices, ceremonies, and whatnot. One of their important jobs was that they were to lead the people in worship, both in praise and in songs before the Lord. Verse 27 shows us some interesting things here. It tells us, first of all, the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. They sought out the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness. And as they begin to worship, it, it, it's keenly noted that they did so with gladness. Does it make us happy to worship the Lord? Right? When we come, when we come to church, or even in, those, even in those moments that aren't a public worship, but even in our own individual lives where um, it's evident of God's working, or either we're personally reading God's word, or we've just had a, um, you know, an important episode of prayer in our lives, does it make us happy to worship God? Sometimes we do things just because we're used to it. I, I, I've done that. I still do that at times, right? I, I, we come to church. It's Sunday. It's Wednesday. That This is what we do. I got to admit, not every time have I been happy about it. Now, I, I can say I don't think that I've come to church and been unhappy that I had to go to church. But it's not like it's either or, right? There have been times I've come and I wasn't unhappy, but it's not like I was entirely excited either, right? It's, it's not that the thought of worship is just something on that day that made me incredibly happy. 
And yet the dedication of these walls and the worship service that begins, it mentions there specifically gladness. The Bible says that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. Serving the Lord should not be a chore. Now you should serve the Lord and you should worship the Lord even if you don't feel like it, right? If you say, I don't feel like it, I'm not happy about it, I don't want to be a fake, so I'm not going to do it. Well, that's not good either, okay? Uh, even if you don't feel like it, even if you're not all entirely excited about it, you should still do it. You should still worship the Lord, but you should serve him with gladness. Psalm 100, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness, it tells us. So keep that in mind. You know, why do we do what we do? Maybe sometimes um, we're just used to it. Sometimes things become a routine, but the worship of God is something that should make us happy. We should be glad to do what we do in his service. It also mentions in verse 27, uh, after it mentions the dedication with gladness, and it also says with thanksgivings. We ought to be a thankful people. Worship should express our thankfulness to the Lord. Now, very important parts of our worship deal with, um, with prayer, whereby we bring the Lord our petitions, we bring him our requests, our concerns, our confessions. Uh, that's an important part of it. An important part of worship is indeed the public preaching, teaching, or speaking of the Word of God. And those things come along with, with conviction. Those things come along with, uh, with, with important lessons, education, um, and we grow thereby. And yet also an important part of our worship is thanksgiving. That what should be expressed in our worship and the songs that we sing and the service that we give to the Lord is that we are thankful. We ought to be thankful, of course, to be God's children. Uh, there is an alternative to that. that there's, there's not being a child of God. And, and certainly that, that is not a happy alternative. We ought to be thankful for what God has done for us. If nothing else, God has saved us. God has saved our souls. We were lost. We were deserving of judgment, deserving to spend an eternity in perdition. And yet he saved us. He loved us and gave himself for us. We're on our way to heaven. God has eternally saved us. We should be thankful. We should be a thankful people. And, and I say, if nothing else, but we, but we should be thankful because he saved us. But obviously, there's a lot else. Salvation is not the only blessing and benefit that we've gained from the Lord. Uh, he's good to us. We have many blessings that we enjoy. Uh, we have hardships. We have difficulties. We have struggles. We deal with loss. We have great grief at times. We should still be a thankful people. Okay, God is still good to us. And so our worship ought to be reflected with thanksgiving. So gladness, thanksgiving, and then of course singing. I think music's an important part of that. I think music's a very important part of worship. When we gather together, we sing. And the, word, and the songs that we sing have words that mean something. We honor Him. We praise Him. We sing songs that are uplifting to Him, that are challenging to each other. And we try to honor Christ with our voice. A lot of worship, a lot of service, a lot of, a lot of church activities center around the preaching of God's Word. And generally when that's going on, it's best practice to have one person doing it at a time. It even says so in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, but the public singing, the using of our voice, it mentions instruments here, cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. And... Uh, you know, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong that the public worship of God and the public singing of God is accompanied with instruments of music. And that's all part of it. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4 that the Lord desires true worshipers and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Joshua chapter 24 tells us that those that worship him need to worship him in sincerity and truth. And, and I want to make sure that we always remember to get both parts of that, right? Spirit and in truth, sincerity and truth. If we're not careful, we, we'll, we'll end up in one of two ditches um, where, where our worship is all emotional. It's all the... It's all the sincerity part and it's gripping and it's heartfelt and it's touching. But, there, but it's not based around the truth. 
It's not based upon the truth of God's word. The other ditch that you fall in is that your worship or your worship services are so much, you know, they're so pointed that everything is, you know, um, it's truth. You, ha- you got to have truth. And yet you, you, you have the truth and it's stale and it's crusty because there's no sincerity behind it, right? You can have the truth. There's lots of people that have the truth and they're mean about it. And their worship services aren't sincere. And you can tell that there's nothing that's real there. Because, you know, well, well, you know, we're the defenders of the faith. And we've, we've got to hold up the truth. Yeah, yeah, you do. But you got to have both, right? They that worship him have to worship him in spirit and in truth. They that worship him have to worship him in sincerity and in truth. Our, our worship services should not be a decision between... Um, driven emotionalism, you know, of sincerity or gripping uh, of the mind and heart, a a choice between that and accuracy, you know, truth and fidelity to the truth. Worship services should be a blending of those ideas where, yes, what we do and what we say, the words that we sing, the sermons that we hear, the public preaching, that 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 stuff is truth. And yet it's mixed with a sincerity. It's mixed with the right spirit. I don't want to have either. I don't want to have emotional service, emotional services where there's no truth. And I don't want to have crusty services where there's truth, but nobody cares, right? Um, And if we're not careful, we can fall into either ditch. And sometimes that starts with us. And sometimes, uh, I guess maybe a good way to describe that is, I think we've all seen it in ourselves, right? That sometimes there have been church services where I didn't get much out of it. And I thought, man, that was just a crusty service. And yet maybe somebody else, not. It wasn't to them. It, It meant something to them. And the spirit of worship was there and the attitude, the heart of love and truth, all of that was there for them. Uh, It can be different for each of us, but hopefully for all of us, when we gather together to worship, uh, the heart is there, the spirit is there, sincerity is there, and the truth is there and that we blend those ideas. What we do here is important. It's obviously important that we preach and teach the truth of God's word. You know what's also important? that that we care, that we care when we're here, that we enjoy when we're here, that we enjoy being here. Um, you really got to have both. If you're going to have real good worship, you really got to have both, sincerity and truth. And I like that they seem like they have that, right? They go to dedicate the walls, and it speaks about gladness, and it speaks about thanksgiving. And then it speaks about the songs and the music. And you just get that spirit of worship that is there. And obviously conducted by the Levites, those that were responsible for teaching them God's word. Now, if you don't think that they blended the two ideas together of spirit and truth, sincerity and truth, what we can see there is verse 27 are the thanksgiving, the worship. The thanksgiving, the gladness, the music. But then notice verse 30. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves. Now there's the mixing, right? Because you've got the sincerity. You've got the joy. You've got the fun. You've got the gladness. You've got all that good stuff. It is going to be centered around truth, though. Because the priests purified themselves. And then it says in verse 30, and the purified the people and the gates and the wall. So the next step was purification. The priests first purified themselves. Obviously, we've already stated, uh, how can you lead people if you yourself aren't setting the example? If you aren't pure, if you aren't cleaned up, it's kind of hard to tell everybody else to to clean up um, when I'm not. So uh, that's important. It says, after they purified themselves, they purified the people. It's really hard to engage in worship when we aren't cleaned up ourselves, 
right? When, we, uh, when our lives aren't the way that they ought to be, our time of worship can be impacted, right? The Bible tells us in uh, Psalm 66, uh, it tells us that, it, that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. It's going to be hard to worship. It's going to be hard to really get engaged with God in prayer if I regard iniquity in my heart. It says, if I regard the iniquity, he won't hear me. And Matthew chapter 5, we're, we're familiar with the story there of, uh, I'm just going to read it, Matthew chapter 5. Therefore, verse 23, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Now, why would he tell you to do that? Well, because if you go to offer your gift and there's aught in your heart or aught against your brother, that's going to impact the worship. That's going to impact the offering of the gift. So, so that the offering of the gift isn't impacted. If you have, you have a gift but you realize in your mind and in your heart that there is aught. There, there is division between you and your brother. Just hold off on the gift. Go get that stuff right. And then come back and offer the gift. Worship can be impacted even by our own, by our own lives, right? If I'm not what I ought to be, it will reflect itself in my worship. So the priests purified themselves. They purified the people. And then it says that they purified the walls and the gates. Purified surroundings help us to walk in purity ourselves. We would be foolish to think that the things that are surrounding us don't potentially impact our worship. The things that we see, the things that we hear. Listen, sometimes the things that are obnoxious, right? Let's, just, let's face it. Golf balls bouncing off the wall wasn't very fun. It... it it was distracting at times. It, impa it, it impacts. When the surroundings are purified, it helps the worship. I'm just, you know, obviously we hope that another golf place doesn't come next door. We don't get control over who comes next door. And we're going to worship and we're going to give it our best go, no matter who's around us. But there are some settings that are easier to worship in than others, aren't there? So the priests, they purified themselves, they purified the people, and then they purified the walls and the gates. And it's a blessing to see how they mixed those ideas, right? There was obviously excitement. There was gladness. There was thanksgiving. There's music with, with instruments and happiness and singing mingled together with truth and people getting right, and people doing right, and the priest being purified and purifying everyone. Let, let's try to remember to blend those ideas, okay? Uh, let's not have worship services that are dominated by one or the other, but that when we come together in the public worship of God, the truth is absolutely paramount. It's absolutely important. Um, the truth can be here, and every one of us be rotten and crusty about it. And that's not helpful, and that's not helpful to worship. So, sincerity and in truth. And it, and it looks like they had that. So, in verse 31, down to verse 43, there is joyful praise. So much so, if you read verse 43 at the end, it says, Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced. Public worship is for everybody. So that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. Boy, when they sang, they got involved. Their joy was such that it could be heard, right? You, you could hear it afar off. Um, you know, some, sometimes in our, in our singing, in our rejoicing or in our efforts of worship, sometimes we're real we're real soft-hearted about it. And I understand that, that everybody's different in their style and everybody's not always as comfortable bellowing out in the music. I, I don't think that's what it's talking about. Obviously, you're talking about thousands of people and the unison of those voices would carry. And that's really the intent of that. But you can tell from this verse, everybody was getting involved and they were excited to get involved. And because they were all together and in unison, their voices could blend 
and be heard afar off. Now there's 10 of us here tonight. All of us singing the best that we could aren't going to be heard a loud way off. Except for the fact that our songs can be heard as far away as heaven. And that God sitting on his throne and Christ sitting at his right hand can hear the worship that we engage in tonight. He's listening. And when we sing with joy in our hearts, when we sing uh, the melody of these songs with joyfulness, gladness in our hearts, he hears it. And he's honored and he's worshiped. And that blesses the Lord's heart. It blesses the Lord when his people join in worship and honor and adore him. So let's just make sure in all the things that have been corrected, right? Walls are rebuilt. All the physical stuff's taken care of. All the spiritual stuff is taken care of as far as things that we got to correct, right? We got to fix the Sabbath. We got to fix the, uh, we got to fix the contributions to the temple. We got to fix the family stuff. Okay, all of that stuff is fixed. Now, public worship, the gathering together for the dedication of these walls breaks out into a worship service where the people are joyful and they're singing and they're happy they're glad, they're giving thanksgiving, and it's just such a joyous time, and it can be heard afar off. It was real. It was real. Um, and I'm not always. There are times that I'm here for the worship service, and, and I'm as ugly inside. Um, and, and sometimes it's not, it's not always one thing. I mean, sometimes it's because it's I'm ugly inside. And I've been a jerk that day, and I have not been kind, and I have not been gracious, and I have not been helpful, and I have not really built up a spirit that is ready to worship. There are other times that I've come, and, and my heart, your heart, is heavy, and you're bothered, and you're worried about things. And, and there's part of it that, that you want to, and, and then there's just part of it that's not there, right? Because the grief... The grief is heavy. Um, listen, that's reality. Those things happen. The goal, the goal of worship, though, is that when we come, we are ready to open our hearts before the Lord. Allow what has happened to happen. Allow the public preaching, the teaching of God's word to be convicting to us, to get some things right. And yet when the opportunity is there in those services to worship God, to honor him with thanksgiving, to honor him with gladness, to honor him with singing, to honor him with the purification of our lives, whatever it may have been, let's do it. Let, let's not let church services, let's not let the public worship of God just pass us by as something that's not important. What, what happens in God's house is great, and, and it's, it can be impactful in our lives. Um, so let's worship him. Let's, let's not neglect when we gather together to worship him. And I don't want your worship to be impacted by my crustiness. And I don't want my worship to be impacted by your crustiness because you guys are crusty too sometimes. When I come, I want to come in the right mind and the right heart to honor God and to worship him for what he's done. And when they did that, you combine chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 it ends in a great dedication service where the men and women and the children are honoring and worshiping God. Okay? That's the end goal. That's the goal of all this stuff that's went before it. God be honored. All right, let's all stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to be.